Welcome to this video on Chebyshev polynomials, the first of an open-ended series. <clears throat> so today we're going to give a little introduction to the nature of the problem and some examples. And we're going to cover one powerful theorem. It's called the alternation theorem and some of its consequences. This is all lead up to some deeper study in the future. So start with what I want to talk about is the concept of error. Now let's say we have a signal that's a flat line here. Forgive my drawing not being perfect, but roll with it. So if we had some interval here, and we had a signal or a attempt to approximate it like this. So a few dots way up high, but the rest of them very close to zero. Or alternatively, we had one like this, all kind of close to zero, but a lot of variety. The question is, which of these is a better approximation? Now we can refer here to the concept of error being how far apart are they from the signal? So if the signal is flat at zero, at each point we could say, what is the vertical distance between the point and the signal? Real signals might be more complicated, but it can be helpful to start with a flat one. Well, we can see we've got a lot of errors here for the blue path, which I'm marking the distances in red, whereas the black one only has a few that are very high, but the rest are very close to zero. So which is a better example, a better estimate? Well, a statistician would probably say the blue one because they are used to thinking in terms of mean squared error where the overall error is expressed by squaring the differences, taking their mean, and then taking the square root to make the units work out right. That is not what we are going to be doing here. For our purposes, the blue one is a much better example, much better estimate than the black one, because while most of its error is pretty small, there are a few very large errors. So what we are really looking at is the Chebyshev norm. And the Chebyshev norm of a polynomial T on some set E or Tn, well, any polynomial really, I'll just say T for now, is the maximum value of the absolute value of T of X for any x's in the set E. I'm using this little Gothic script for E. I could have used F instead of T. But that's our idea then. The norm, Chebyshev norm, is the error, the maximum error. So our goal here is to make the maximum error on some set as small as possible. Now, the classical version of this is on the interval 0, 1. So if I draw the Cartesian plane here, and I draw here's negative 1 to 1, we're going to go through a few examples here of different degree polynomials that minimize the error. So that is to say, can you give me I should emphasize monic polynomials. That is to say the first term is coefficient one. So x squared plus something, x cubed plus something, x to the n in general plus something. And the reason for that is just simply that if we didn't restrict that, we could easily make them larger just by changing the coefficient. So we're forced to fix the first term as being coefficient of one. So on this set, well, x, the first one, what we'll call t1 of x, 
And it's pretty obviously just X. We don't really have many choices. We could add a constant if we wanted to, but I don't see how that would help. It goes from negative one to one. So the norm of X on this set is just one. And that's because the function gets to a height of positive one and a depth of negative one. So the error is never more than one. It does get to one. T2, the second degree polynomial would be X squared minus a half. And so it would look like this. Uh, excuse me, sort of like that. But we have a height of one half at both negative one and positive one. The lowest point is zero, negative one half. So once again, the norm here is one half. And then with a little work, we can continue this. We can say T3 of X is X to the third minus three fourths X. And that goes from a one fourth here at one, negative one fourth here at negative one, and it goes up to positive one fourth. You could work out the X value, but we don't really need it. We just want to know what the error is. It goes through zero, goes down back to negative one fourth and back up to one half, or sorry, to one fourth, excuse me. So the Y values range from negative one fourth to positive one fourth. Therefore, the norm here is one fourth. If we want to go to fourth degree polynomial, the fourth degree polynomial, uh, should use it, no, I'm out of colors. Now the fourth degree polynomial is X fourth minus X squared plus one eighth. And so trying to draw this is probably not a good idea, but it looks something like this. Its norm though would be one eighth. And uh, if you want to graph that yourself to verify, you can. But it is, it goes one eighth when you plug in one and also one eighth when you plug in negative one and zero. And in two other numbers, you can arrange to get negative, well, yeah, one eighth at negative one, one and zero and negative one eighth at a couple places other than those. So as I say, this is pretty well established. It's been studied for quite a while. And so we don't really need to do much about this, but we there is a pattern you might have noticed, and that's that these are decreasing exponentially. The first power term has a norm of one half to the zero. Second power term has a norm of one half or one half to the one and one fourth and one eighth. We keep raising one half to higher powers as we increase the degree. <coughs> So that's good to know because we can tell how fast they're decreasing. And I feel like we want to know this when we're modeling. There's a question of parsimony here. Do we make the model more complicated in order to decrease the error? Is it worth doing? Well, if we're gonna try that, it's worth knowing how far do we have to go to reduce the error to a certain degree to begin with. And we know it for negative one to one. But our question here that we're really focused on is, let's say we have some other set. Now, we're going to restrict ourselves to compact sets, which compact just meaning closed and bounded. We're in the real number line. We're using the usual metric topology. So that's just meaning closed and bounded. Our Gothic script E. And the <coughs> it is... We can show that there will be a specific polynomial that minimizes the Chebyshev norm, minimizes the maximal error. I'm not going to justify that statement. I'm just going to sort of appeal to what you know about compactness. Compact sets, closed and bounded, the, one of their defining properties, one of the most notable things is that you can always get max and mins for continuous functions. So it feels right. <clears throat> 
whenever we're doing something and we're saying, is it possible to find a max or a min? As long as we're on a compact set, we can. So I'm going to do a specific set, negative one to one, union two. And why did I pick this example? I'm not sure. I just made up something that would be compact and not too complicated. And this is really not very different than what we started with. And yet that one extra point will change things quite a bit. So let's take a look at what we're dealing with. I have a point, I have a graph here. This is negative one, this is one, and then here's two. So let's go through the process of developing what the Chebyshev polynomials are. So T1 of X, well, since we're insisting they be monic, the first term is just X. Do we want to add any sort of a constant here? Well, let's see what happens if we just do X by itself. Plug in negative one, we'll get negative one, negative one, in a nice leisurely slope of one, get to a maximum of two, two. Now, is that the best we can do? And hopefully you're already saying no. And the reason is because we can subtract off to make this symmetric. Let's say it reaches a height of two and a depth of negative one, there is a mean value, mu if you like, of one half. And because of that one half there, <clears throat> it is not centered at zero. So we will just subtract it off. So if we go, instead of x, we go x minus a half. Then it'll go from plug in negative one, we get negative one, negative three halves up to, and if we plug in two to that, two minus a half will become two comma, excuse me, that's not right, two, comma three over two. So that is our first Chebyshev polynomial, x minus a half. And its norm, the T1 norm on E, and this is a property of E itself. Given E, we can find the perfect polynomial. So therefore E itself has a Chebyshev norm. It is the maximum of the ideal polynomial. It is three halves. And so we can't beat that. But this also makes an important point, which is that the range of these Chebyshev polynomials is symmetric. That is to say, it will be negative t n over e to positive t n over e. Because if it ever weren't, we would just subtract off the mean value to center it at zero. That would reduce the max. Uh, it would reduce the maximum distance. It would increase the distance at the other side, but in such a way that the two would eventually balance out. So our next example will be a parabola. So let's try and do this. Let's say we have a, our set here from negative one to one with two off here. And let's just say as a guess that it looked something like this down to here and up to about here. So we've already proven before that this point here 
has to be the same distance from zero as this point. That is, they have opposite signs of one another, but they are the same value. Now, I am going to argue that what you see here is impossible. And here's why. This parabola we've drawn must be something of the form x squared plus bx plus c. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to take a negative point below this peak, or a positive point, but lower than that peak, and a negative point over here above that trough there, and draw a line between them. Now, this line, uh, we'll call it, um, I don't know, uh, Sx plus t. So, what happens if we subtract it? Well, this max will get smaller, and this minimum will get smaller. Now, this other piece over here will get larger. So, maybe that won't work like what we want. But I'm going to say, since this line is what it is, we can multiply it by any small number to make it closer to the origin like that. I'll call the green one Sx plus t, maybe times epsilon. That's probably a good way to do it. Epsilon is a shrinking factor. What happens here then is this will decrease this will increase. This one might increase and get a larger error, but since the slope is so small, it won't be very much. So we're going to subtract this epsilon sx plus epsilon t, and this will still start with x squared, so it's a new monic parabola. So what just happened here is we subtracted off something to make a new parabola which will have a smaller Chebyshev norm. We have made the max and min shrink, get closer to zero, and the other end of it, it did go up, but not by very much, not enough to surpass our previous max, which is all the way up here. So therefore, the way we drew this had to have been wrong. And the core problem here was that the max on this side and the max on this side were not at the same height. So we're going to undo that. We're going to now say, okay, however we do this, the endpoints have to be the same height. So here we are, one, negative one something, one something, and then two. So those now are maxes. The parabola must go down like this. And this is entirely predictable. If we have two points like this, and we already know from the earlier part that the minimum and the maximum have to be the same value. So all three of these points are the same value except with different signs. So we can work out the equation for the parabola knowing those facts. So we start with t2 of x is x squared plus bx plus c. We could work out the vertex. Would have to be at one half because of the symmetry of all parabolas. The halfway point between negative one and two would be the vertex and that's positive one half. And it would be negative the norm. So we'll work out what that is over time. All right. If I plug in 2, I get 4 plus 2b plus c. And if I plug in negative 1, I get 1 minus b plus c. Now those two things are equal. So if we set them equal and you know, the c's subtract out, combining, this gives us 
4 plus 2b equals 1 minus b, which, let's do a little basic algebra, and we get b is negative 1. Yeah. All right, so that's b is negative 1. So I can go back, I'll erase this. and say we can update this equation to be t2 of x is x squared minus x plus c. So now we want to plug in the 1 half because we know since it's the vertex, it's also the minimum. So t2 of 1 half is... I'm taking my time here because I've made a lot of algebra mistakes when I was doing this earlier. And so tell my students, take your time, make sure you don't mess anything up. So T2 gave us 1 fourth minus 1 half plus C or negative 1 fourth plus C. And if I plug in T2 of 2, that would give me 4 minus 2 or 2 plus C. So these are opposites. So we have negative two plus C equals negative one fourth plus C. And I trust you can work out the algebra there and get C is negative seven over eight. So that's what we end up with. The parabola is x squared minus x minus 7 over 8. And then if we work that out, we plug in 2 to that and or plug in negative 1. And in both cases, we get a value of 9 over 8. Well, let's check that just to be sure. T2 of 2 is 4 minus 2 minus 7 over 8. That is 2 minus 7 over 8, which is 16 over 8 minus 7 over 8, or 9 over 8. And take my word for it, or don't try it out yourself, but the other points will also give you 9 eighths and negative 9 eighths. So the T2 norm for this is 9 over 8. And now let's look at a T3 problem. And at this point, it starts to get harder. Now, there are probably some theorems that maybe could help you in tracking down the specific values. But... I'm not really gonna to worry too much about that. I wanna focus more on the concept here. So let's say T3 of X. I can't remember why, but for some reason, this is what I came up with the first time I tried this. X to the fifth, third minus six fifths X squared minus X. It seems reasonable. It certainly seems like that could be the Chebyshev polynomial. At least to me, I don't see any obvious reason why it couldn't be on this set. But when I graphed that, what I got was this. Something kind of like this. Here was the dotted line, um, I'm called the uh, this little dotted line here. That's at one. For the part that's outside the set E, this little gap between one and two, I'm just gonna use a little dotted line. And it looked like this. Here it was negative one, negative 1 1.2. Over here it was 1, negative 1 1.2, although it did go down a little more after that. And up here it was 2, 1.2. But this right here was something, y value t of something like 
0.165. It was a lot lower than the other one. And that told me that I must have done something wrong. Why? How can I be so sure of that? Well, we're going to do a similar trick to what we've done in the last couple examples, which is let's find the sp spots where it hits 1.2 or negative 1.2, these points here. Now, there's only three of them. Because there's only three, we could get a parabola that is close to those, or at least matches their signs. Say, here, 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 maybe. I don't know if that's great. I'm not sure if the drawing works that well. Maybe something like that. That looks like a parabola. I'm not claiming to be a perfect artist. But this thing is of the form ax squared plus bx plus c. And so I can subtract that off. And I'll get a new third degree polynomial. And that would have shrunk all three of those blue points. It would have made them all get closer to the x-axis. Now, again, we have the problem of this point might grow when we subtract a negative from it, but we can always multiply by epsilon again to make it be a lot shallower if we need to. This part that we're subtracting can be anything. It doesn't have to be monic. We're just subtracting it. But you'll notice here now, we have not touched x cubed. And that's the important part of all of this. Since we didn't touch the x cubed, we still have a monic polynomial, which means we are still in the set where the one we started with was supposedly the best choice. It supposedly had the lowest norm, but we've just shrunk the norm without touching the lead term. And so that's the key to what we're doing here. And now we've alluded to it. We've done a few examples. So we're going to show a somewhat formal proof here. We'll sort of do a proof by picture. But um, I wanted to show a couple more versions, by the way, the what the x cubed could look like. Because what we ended up seeing here is the problem was we had one point that did not reach the maximum that the other points did. So that will be the deal. We'll have to have this, this, go up, come back down, and go back up. We'll have to hit those four points. The funny thing, though, is that this does not have to be a max in the true sense because at this point we are outside the interval so it could go down some more and then come back up to the same point or maybe we go through this thing like that and we hit a valley here and start going back up before it goes that way there's a couple different ways this could look like but in each case, we'll have minimum, maximum, minimum, maximum, all with the same value, give or take a sign. So now that we've done that, we are going to be a little more formal and show why a set like that has to exist no matter what. And so we're going to get into what's called the alternation theorem. Like I said, I'm going to try to do this more as a proof by picture rather than a super formal thing. The, this is a version of a proof that was attributed to Markov, though it has been updated in the paper that we are discussing. And pretty simple, it says that N E for a Chebyshev polynomial 
t to the n, there is a set x naught less than x1, less than x2, less than dot, 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 less than x to the n, where the points alternate between max and min. The formula for that involves a negative one to the n power, which is what we use to switch signs in calculus. But I'm just saying it more informally. We have a set of points. Notice there's n plus one of them. So one more than the degree of the polynomial. And they switch between maxes and mins, which all have the same absolute value. The reason for this, we can just sort of continue on with what we've been doing the whole time with the previous examples. We say, suppose we have some sort of function here that is nth degree but it does not have one of these alternating sets. So let's do it like this. And then this next point doesn't quite go all the way. Well, we can do the same thing we've been doing because it has fewer than n plus one points. It has k, extremal points, k points where it achieves that max or min. Well, if you have k points, you can fit a k minus one degree function, polynomial, to those points. So what we could do is we could pick points at each of these places where it is extremal a little closer somewhere with the same sign, but closer to zero. And find some sort of polynomial that goes through all of them, like that. And we can, if it's when we subtract it off, that is we have Tn of x, is x to the n plus dot, dot, dot. Minus, excuse me, sorry about that. Minus a x to the k plus dot, dot, dot. But again, the point is since k is less than n, that was, I didn't say that, but that was the assumption we were making, we will not be touching x to the n here. So we will be subtracting off something from all the extremal points, thus making them all get closer to zero. And since we can do that same epsilon trick if we need to, we can multiply this blue function by whatever, and it will shrink it. I realize I never actually drew the function that supposedly went through all these points. The points themselves were kind of the more important thing, but let's draw it anyway just to be complete. So the black function, or red, whichever color you want to use here, minus the blue function will be some new, some new n3 polynomial that will have a smaller Jebyshev norm. And as I said before, if this, when you subtract it, makes it too big, we can always shrink the blue part down. Point is, no matter what, we will be making these points get smaller because we'll be subtracting something of the same sign as them. Whereas this one over here, it'll get larger, but if we shrink it small enough, we shrink the blue function enough, 
then it will not get too much larger. So that's the key theorem here. If we have found the proper Chebyshev polynomial, then we will have one of these alternating sets of exactly n plus one points that keep switching between positive and negative as we go from left to right. So that is, okay. That is very important to us. The reason why that trick does not work if we have an alternating set is because if we tried to find another interpolating polynomial to match all of the points, n plus one points, we might have to make an nth degree polynomial, which means it would have an x to the n term. But when we subtract off the x to the n term, we had tnx is x to the n plus something, and we subtracted off some ax to the n plus something. Well, now we are changing the lead term. And that's not allowed, because once we change the lead term, well, that's no longer relevant. The point is the Chebyshev polynomial is the minimum among the monic polynomials. So changing it to a non-monic polynomial does not cause any contradiction because that's not relevant to it. It's not no longer in the set that it's the minimum of. Okay, so when I saw that earlier case where it did not have an altering set, I knew instantly that something was wrong. But what about the other way? Is there a converse here? If I were to find some polynomial that did have an alternating set, one, two, three, four, if I managed to work out what that was, could I be sure that it was the right one? Well, the answer is yes, there is a converse here as well. So let's prove that. This is the one big proof for this video. <clears throat> All right, so let's say we let Pn have an alternating set. And assume that the norm of Pn is greater than norm of Tn. That is to say, it's some other polynomial with an alternating set, but the Chebyshev polynomial is still less than it. All right. So we can define a new function. Q is Pn minus Tn. So at each x of j in the alternating set for pn, q has the same sign as pn. You know, if Pn and Tn have the same sign, then subtract off Tn just makes it closer to zero. If they have opposite signs, subtracting Tn makes it get even farther from zero. But since Tn is smaller and it's Chebyshev, sorry, Pn has a larger Chebyshev norm. So at the alternating points, it must be farther away from zero than Tn is, because those are its largest or most negative points. So Pn has an altering set. So Pn switches signs n times. 
And you think about that for a second as n plus one points in between each pair it switches, so that's n switches. So Q is the same way. Q has the same sign as PN at those alternating points, so it must have at least n sign switches. And now the intermediate value theorem from first semester calculus says if you switch from positive to negative with a polynomial, which is continuous, you must have a zero. So Q has n zeros. But Pn and Tn are both monic. It's possible I didn't explicitly state Pn was monic before, but it wouldn't really be it wouldn't really care if it wasn't. The whole point of this is we are assuming we had some polynomial, monic polynomial that was larger norm than Tn. So since they're both monic, Q has degree less than N. Okay, sorry for kind of the weird edit just there. I had to wipe the screen, but where we left off, we had just shown that this Q we constructed, since PN and TN are both monic, Q does not have an nth degree term. PN would start with X to the N, and TN also starts with X to the N. So its degree is less than N, but it has n zeros. Well, hopefully it's clear that that is nonsense. So it was a contradiction. Therefore, we can conclude that in fact, the assumption of the PN norm being greater than the TN norm was false. So that's not true. Or, yes. And it can't possibly be less than TN norm because by definition, the Trebuchet polynomial has the smallest norm. Therefore, these norms are equal. So, We've now established that if there's a second polynomial with an alternating set, it must reach the same heights. Does that mean they are actually the same function? Well, we say let Tn and, well, let's stick with Pn be minimizers. So they both reach the same maximal height. If we define a new polynomial, Q is the mean of these two, one half Tn plus Pn. It's also a minimizer. It must have the same norm. Go. Sorry about this. this is, mm. Okay. So Q at Q's extremal points, TN and PN are also extremal. And just take a minute to think about why that is. At any point, <clears throat> if the average of them is at the max, neither of them, since they have the same norm, neither of them can be higher, so therefore neither of them can be lower either. Therefore they must be equal. So at the 
alternating points of Q, Tn of x has to equal Pn of x. So therefore, they agree at n plus 1 points. Well, a polynomial of n degree is defined by n plus 1 points. So therefore, they are equal. So there is only one minimizing polynomial. The Chebyshev polynomial is unique. That is what we have just proved. Okay, so that theorem is going to have a lot of useful implications. So let's go over a few of those right now. Hmm. For starters, all zeros of any Chebyshev polynomial are real. And three polynomial has n zeros. It would certainly seem possible that some of them are non-real, but that's not true. And so I'm going to draw an example here to give an idea of why this is. And we'll just use this example. It'll be a little more complicated than our previous example. Let's say we do like this. Here and here and here. Let's say we've worked out the polynomial and it looks like something like this. The Chebyshev polynomial. So it'll go from here. Let's fix our alternating set first. I'll put an alternating point here. I'll put another one up here. And we'll put one. One, two, three, four, five, six. So maybe so like this. A little dotted thing down here. And from here up to there, to there. Down this way. Up to here there. Something like that. I'll mark the alternating points. They are this, 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 or should I go left, right? One, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay, so this, I will call the union of all these little black closed intervals will be E. Now the reason this is would be a fifth degree, so we'll call this T5 of X on E. Might be like that or something. <clears throat> So why are all the zeros real? Well, this goes back to the old fashioned intermediate value theorem from first semester calculus. This function can be seen as taking real numbers to real numbers. Therefore, intermediate value theorem just simply says, if you've got a point above a line and a point below the line at some point that has to cross the line. Well, we see it does that five times. One, two, three, four, five, six. I, I should have started with zero. It crosses five times is what I meant to say. So therefore, it has five zeros. A fifth degree polynomial can't have more than five zeros. So therefore, that accounts for all five of them. And in fact, we can go even stronger than that. So I'm going to mark the range here. Now let's stick with the red. The 
polynomials between these two horizontal lines roughly drawn. I, my drawing's never very good, but pretend it goes right through those peaks. Well, if we take any alpha that is between negative t and e, or t five e in this case, and positive t five e, pick any point that's between them, not including the highest point, say like here, this is alpha, the horizontal line, it also has to cross five times because once again, anytime you can find a place, it has to be between two alternating points. So the line of zero is not special. Any horizontal line we can draw will cross this graph five times. So T5 of X equals alpha or T5 of X minus alpha equals zero. Well, that is itself a fifth degree polynomial. Alpha is a constant. So it also only has five solutions, meaning we now have them all. So let's think about what this means. Now, if you look at this then, and all the solutions then must be between this first point and this last point up here. Between those endpoints, the signs switch five times, thus accounting for every value for every point in the range. So it seems, or at least naively, it would seem reasonable to say, how do we know there aren't some non-real numbers that map into this? We've got this range of real numbers from negative the norm to positive the norm, some interval on y here. Are you sure there aren't any non-real numbers that map into it? Well, yeah, we are sure because these are polynomials. There's no room for anyone. We've used them up. So we want to be able to describe all these other points. As we've said, this alpha crosses five times. Not all of the places where it crosses are part of E. This one, for example, is not in E. This uh, right there, that's outside of E. But it might be worth knowing those places anyway. So we're going to introduce some new terminology notation. So let's move down. And I'm going to introduce you to E's cousins. And this is a term that is just something I call it. It's a little silly, I guess, but I like it. So here's what I am saying. Let's say that we have a polynomial. We have T5 of X equals alpha. But there's some other number, T5 of Y, and it also equals alpha. Well, what we're saying here is there's some process by which you go five layers deep, a polynomial of a fifth degree, get to alpha. X and Y have this common ancestor five generations away from them. I guess forward, not backward. But so I will call X and Y fifth cousins. So again, this is not a formal term. This is just how I think of it. So if I said then e to the e sub 5 is 
E and all its fifth dozens. All the other things that end up inside the same, that end up going to the same places that E gets taken to. So let's be a little more formal about this. I'm going to say E sub N equals TN inverse of the closed interval negative of negative TN E to positive TN E. So this is saying, find all the things. Once we find the polynomial, we can determine what its range is. And then we say the pull back to say, what are any other points that get mapped into that same range? So in the simpler example we saw earlier, where it was the parabola here, it looked like something like this, maybe. Now this part here in blue was not part of E, but everything in that interval gets mapped into the same vertical band that E gets mapped into. So therefore it counts. So E2 would be everything from negative one to two because there's nothing in there that gets mapped to a different place, a different Y value than E itself gets mapped to. Let's look at the um, fifth degree example that I drew just earlier. Uh, let me find it for you. Um, where to go? Where to go? Where to go? I may have erased it. All right, well, I'll draw it again. So it looked something like this. Where the union of those intervals is E. And so we said those crit the alternating points were here, 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 here in the middle, at the end point of this one, and at the other end point up here. So it went like this, dotted lines for the parts of the polynomial that are not in E. Polynomial still takes on values, they just don't count if they're not in E. <clears throat> This was not a critical point or an alternating point, I mean to say, excuse me. But then this goes down to here. Um, oh no, it went down farther than that. It went down to here and then back up to here. This one's drawn a little too high. Remember, they should all be at the same height. Pretending I drew this absolutely perfectly. So, what is, if this was T5 of X, then what was E5? Let me use blue here. 
Well, we need to indicate, we need to in, extend this to anything that also gets between the red line. So that means here, we need to get to include this bit. And then all of this along here needs to be included. So we'll do this. And that's it. So E5 would be those combined. E5 is E and its fifth cousins. Um, yeah, we included this part here too. Now, since we said those are all covered by these horizontal lines that cut it, they are all inside of what's called the convex hole of E. So the convex hole is the biggest set here. CVH of E is how we write it. And it's just the largest interval or the smallest interval that contains all of the points in here. So it's just the lowest point to the highest point. If we were in higher dimensions, 3D or two, even 2D, it might be harder to find the convex hole. But for one-dimensional, it's pretty simple. So we're going to give a little set, equa set containment to fill in what we've just said. So, as I said, E is in R, but E is also in C. But as we said, there are plenty of cases where you might have a function that only has some real values or that has some complex values get mapped to the same thing as the real values, but not in these cases. Combine the intermediate value theorem with the alternating theorem, we can see En, which we're defining as Tn inverse of the range from the negative of the norm to the norm itself, the whole range of Tn, We should have brackets there. That E is contained in EN. There's a basic set theory said that, but you can also just sort of logic your way through it. E itself is E, and E is going to be related to itself no matter what the polynomial is. And that is contained in the convex hull of E. So if E were connected, these would be the same thing. It's only when they're not connected that we have a problem and they have a difference with these things. And that is itself contained in R. Okay, now a few pieces of vocabulary just to fill in. A gap is probably pretty self explanatory. It's a bounded, connected component of R without E. So, uh, yes. So the outside of the interval doesn't count. If we get the convex hole here, those parts of the left and right are unbounded, so we don't count them. So the gaps would be these pieces in here. They're not part of E, but they are connected and bounded. Now, it can be seen each gap has at most one 
zero. And that's because alt, the alternating points are in E. So our alternating points could be maybe like here and here, wherever, but we saw from our graphs earlier, if you're going to go in between the zeros, you're going to have one of the alternating points. So if I wanted to have a zero here and here, the function would have to go up to the top and back down, or vice versa. And it can't do that because then it would mean there's an alternating point that's not in E itself, because E is just those closed intervals. So a gap might not have any zeros, but it can't have more than one. And so then another term is a finite gap set, which you can probably guess means there are only finite many gaps, but also it has to have no singleton components. So for example, earlier example of negative one to one union two, well, that is not a finite gap set because it's got that singleton component. I don't actually know why, I'm sure this will come up in the future. Uh, I can imagine some topological reasons why singletons could cause problems. You can't do derivatives on a singleton, for instance. But, well, I think we could probably, if I wanted to, I could probably change this to like 1.9 to 2 over here. And then it would be a finite gap set because there's only one gap and there's no singletons. My hunch is that the first few polynomials would be the same. I mean, this one would still have an alternating set, so it would still work. But as the degree goes up, I imagine when we get to the point where we start seeing maxes and mins inside this interval, that will probably cause problems. So all I'm saying is the example we've been using is maybe not one we'll use that much, but it's still instructive. Uh, one other thing, it's the function, whatever Chebyshev polynomial we have, if we map all its zeros, outside the zero set, it has to be monotone. And what do we got here? We got six zeros. All six zeros are real, so that counts for all of them. So therefore, this is a T6 polynomial. Uh, let's put one more. I want to make it odd. So this polynomial, it'll go like this. I'm assuming E is... Um, well, it actually doesn't matter. It's still the same polynomial. I'm assuming E is just the whole interval, but I'm sure this could modify for if it were had gaps in it. Now, as we see here, one, two, three, four, five, six, we've used up all six turning points. The derivative of a seventh degree polynomial is, of course, a six degree polynomial. Therefore, that six degree polynomial can only have six zeros. So it cannot have any more turning points. So once it gets past this last zero, it has to just keep going in the same direction it's been going. Same here. So these endpoints are themselves extremal points. Now they may not be part of the altering set, depending on how you choose it. 